Okay, this is Free Talk Live. I have no idea if we are on the air right now. We seem to be having some technical difficulties, or the, the network is. Somebody's having some technical difficulties. So, welcome to the program. We're going to presume now it's sounding better. Saturday edition of the show. And tonight, uh, it is Ian here with you. Oh, hang on a second there, Julia. And Julia. Julia is with us as well, uh, sitting in for Mark, who is vacationing down in Florida. Maybe he's listening to us tonight on WFLA down there. I don't know. Uh, But welcome to the program, the show about your calls. You call in about absolutely anything. Toll-free number 800-259-9231. That is the SACL CAI toll-free line. We're going to start things out here uh, with a guest tonight. He is a free market economist and anarcho-capitalist associated with the Austrian school. At least, uh, Dr. Walter Block, that is what Wikipedia says about you. How would you describe yourself? Uh, That's a pretty good description. Thanks for having me on your show. Well, welcome to the program uh, tonight. We basically had you on uh, because of popular demand. Normally don't have guests here on Free Talk Live, but a lot of people were asking for you. And so I finally broke down and decided to uh, to make this happen. So I'm glad you're here. And I've got your book in my hands. Unfortunately, I've never had the chance to read it quite yet. It's in my stack of uh, two reads. But it is just a uh, – it is one of those books that you – that is really outrageous looking uh defending the un- uh, the defending the undefendable what is this book dr block well it's really just an attempt to promote the libertarian philosophy and the libertarian philosophy is predicated on two basic premises uh one is the non-aggression axiom uh the non-aggression axiom just means keep your mitts to yourself don't be putting your fingers in your neighbor's pocketbook don't be putting your fingers around his throat mm-hmm. um, the second axiom of libertarianism is property rights because uh we need property rights because if you're putting your fingers in your neighbor's pocket you might be innocent of a crime if he stole stuff from you yesterday and put it in his pocket and you're just returning it to yourself So we have to have a theory of property rights, which is based on homesteading and voluntary trade. So that's sort of libertarianism in a nutshell. And what I'm doing in this book is defending all sorts of people who are hated, reviled, uh, people disgusted at them, they're called criminals, but they don't violate the libertarian axioms. And as long as they don't violate the libertarian axioms, uh, what they do is sometimes disgusting, and sometimes I wouldn't want it done to me, or I wouldn't want to engage in it myself, but... My thesis is that it's improper to make criminals of them, like yeah. they might be engaging in victimless crimes, not real crimes. So, I For mean, example, just to give just to give our listeners some uh, some idea of what we're talking about here, uh, you list in the book a number of different uh, types of people that are, are just reviled by many people around the, the country, around the world. I mean, people like uh, prostitutes, pimps, uh, blackmailers. Ticket scalpers and money lenders. Uh, I'm just I'm picking some of these out here. The, a slumlord. I mean, what would you what would you have to say about a slumlord? Well, uh, what is a slumlord? First, a slumlord is a person who engages in renting slummy buildings. Mm-hmm. And uh, if you engage in the rental of uh, slummy buildings, the question I ask is: Are you per se violating the libertarian axiom? And I can't see my way clear to thinking that you are, because assuming no fraud, in other words, you're not renting something at luxury levels and, you know, it's, it's really a rat hole. But, you know, the tenant comes in and sees a rat hole and says, uh, okay, I'll take it, because mm-hmm. the rent is very cheap. Well, that's what a slumlord does. The slumlord rents slums to people. And then do-gooders and lefties and people who don't know any economics come around and say, Uh Aha, this is a slum. You're exploiting your tenants. You're not giving them hot and cold running water. There are rats here or whatever it is that that makes up for the slum. And the answer is, well, yeah, that's true, but um, he didn't violate the libertarian axiom. He didn't uh, pick up his fist or a gun and smack somebody with it or shoot somebody with it. So you're saying that a slumlord isn't uh, committing any sort of crime against humanity or anything like that because he's operating on a completely voluntary basis. He may be a scumbag, he may be a lowlife, 
and uh, his uh, his tenant uh, the, the tenants may be less than pleased with uh, the deal they ended up deciding to get themselves into, but they made that choice. Is what is kind of what you're pointing out here? What it really boils well, down to is it, even for someone who doesn't under really understand the libertarian philosophy, it's just a contractual agreement. And if both parties are clear on the terms of the contract, I will rent you this disgusting rat hole with no running water in exchange for a hundred dollars a month then there was really no crime committed. Right. I, hey, you, you sound pretty good. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. You sound like a libertarian. You've got it. Uh, I wouldn't call them scumbags, uh, although many people do, uh, but these are the do-gooder types. I would just say that he's an honest businessman renting a, a very low-level, low-quality um, uh, product. But, you know, there well. are other Sometimes, I mean, to be fair though, not that I've ever lived in uh, in, a, in a slum, but I, I do have the understanding that some landlords are better than others at, say, fixing some of the problems with their uh, with their buildings, at, regardless of what level uh, they're they're kept up at. Uh, but if if you've if you've gotten into a rental situation and someone has told you they're going to be uh, you know taking care of things as a landlord and then they decide to you know make you wait a month before they fix the hot water that kind of thing I think those are the types of people who tend to get labeled as a slumlord and that's kind of that is kind of scummy behavior not well, taking care yeah, of your property I would though. say that's fraudulent behavior and fraud is a form of theft. In other words, if I sell you 10 pounds of potatoes and it turns out there are 10 pounds of rocks in the bag, mm-hmm. in, in effect, I've stolen your money. Uh, and that's fraud. But let's take uh, somebody who sells, you know, crap or rocks or slummy apartments and, you know, you ask, well, will you be fixing the hot water? And the guy says, no, take it as is, right? Yeah. Well, that's not fraud. Uh, it's a very low uh, quality uh, service, but... Uh, well, look, suppose I sell you rotten bananas. Rotten bananas are pretty lousy, right? Mm-hmm. And, sure. Unless and you're you making ask, well, are they rotten? I say, you're Dawn Tootin, they're rotten. But I'm selling them to you for a penny a piece or some very low price. Well, why am I a scumbag? Why am I just selling you crappy stuff or bad stuff? And by the fact, uh, as Julia said, uh, that both parties agreed we can infer, if we're economists, that both parties gain, at least in the ex-ante sense. So there's nothing untoward going on here. There's nothing um, scummy or scumbaggy or whatever the word is. It's just uh, selling uh, low-level uh, inferior merchandise. So, uh, Dr. Block, do you have a website of your own that, uh, that you like to promote, or is there somewhere our listeners can go to visit you online, perhaps read your writings, that sort of thing? Well, a lot of my writings are on the Mises web, M-I-S-E-S. Just go to Mises.com. Mm-hmm. I have my own website, uh, WalterBlock.com. Uh, but the Mises uh, has got a lot more of my stuff than I have myself. Uh, for example, they'll probably be picking up this interview, so if somebody misses the interview, they can, they can get it from there. Okay, great. But uh, l- let's talk a little, if it's possible, let's talk just a little bit more about the, uh, the slumlord. Uh, sure. The reason we have public housing is because uh, do-gooders uh, were unhappy with what was called tenement housing. Mm-hmm. Uh, tenement housing was high rises, maybe six or eight uh, stories high, railroad flats with maybe cold water, maybe not hot water, and uh, uh, they were relatively safe. People were there; they were, you know, they had no better place to go to. The rents were very low. But the do-gooders decided that this is uh, unconscionable, unacceptable, scumbaggy, if I can use that word. And what they did is they ripped them down, and you know what they did instead? They put up public housing. Which turned into absolute garbage. I'm sorry? Which turned into eventually absolute garbage as far as uh, Oh, yes, absolutely. Uh, Absolutely, absolutely garbage. And and there's an element of force, of course, behind the public housing, whereas with, as you pointed out, with a slumlord – it's all a completely voluntary arrangement. We're all, all right. forced, all forced uh, the, by the threat of violence to pay for these government housing projects. Whereas if the, as you call them, the do-gooders, I don't know if that's necessarily an you know, appropriate term because they're not doing good. They're doing evil by, uh, you know, by forcing people to pay for their ideas. If they actually had a good idea, they could have gone out, funded it themselves, and created their own better apartments uh, that people could have had at, uh, at affordable rates. But that's not how they work. Uh, Dr. Block, hang on. We're going to bring you back here. If you've got a question for him, you can spend a little bit more time with us, yes? 
Oh, yeah. Hopefully. Yeah. All right, for great. For Hang on. 800-259-9230. This is Free Talk Live. It's your show, the Saturday edition. You can bring up whatever's on your mind at 800-259-9231, though. If you've got a question for our special guest, Dr. Walter Block, uh, your calls will be given priority at this moment because he is with us. Uh, The number again, 800-259-9231. Tonight, it's Ian here with you. And Julia. And you can join us on our website at freetalklive.com. The features, they are completely free. Uh, those features include the Shrine of Female listeners, the dozens of ladies who have taken the time to send us their validated photo and proof they listen to the show. See them at shrine.freetalklive.com. And if you are a lady listener interested in joining the Shrine, the uh, details are there for you, shrine.freetalklive.com. Free Talk Live is brought to you by the Free State Project's Porcupine Freedom Festival coming up in less than a week's time. Uh, at this time next week, we'll be broadcasting live from the Porcupine Freedom Festival. Uh, Julia, you'll be coming out to join us. Mark will be there. Uh, most all of the Free Talk Live crew, of course, hundreds of liberty-minded people, will be getting together in Lancaster, New Hampshire at, uh, I think it's Rogers Campground, and hanging out and socializing and enjoying one another's company for an entire weekend, Thursday, Friday, Saturday, and Sunday. Uh, we're looking forward to it very much, so it's going to be an absolute blast a uh, great opportunity to come up uh, as an excuse to to see New Hampshire, tour around the state, find out what these uh, crazy Free State Project members are all about, uh, because they're an interesting and really awesome group of people. So uh, make a point of going to porkfest.com. That's porkfest with a C, porkfest.com, and getting registered and get up here for uh, for next weekend. It's going to be a lot of fun. All right, we bring back Dr. Walter Block. Uh, if you're in uh, Louisiana, is that right? Uh, I'm a professor at Loyola University, New Orleans, yes. Okay, all right, very good. Uh, so we're talking about Defending the Undefendable. It's your it's your book, and uh, it's, it's kind of, a, I guess, an older book. Um, in fact, one of our listeners has a question for you. We're going to get to some calls here about what your past was like, uh, Dr. Block, and how you came to uh, where you are as far as your philosophy is concerned. We're going to get to that uh, here in one moment. But first, let's talk to lady listeners first. Uh, Margie is in Michigan listening to WTKG. Margie, you're on with Dr. Walter Block. Thank you. Dr. Block, I'm interested in hearing more about the libertarian view of property rights because if I live in a nice house and a slumlord buys the house next door to me, and decides not to keep it up very well, and suddenly I have rats in my house that I didn't used to have, and then my property value goes down. How is that a sort of victimless crime? Well, um, if he, if your friendly neighbor brings rats to you, that's sort of like trespass. It's almost like... Um... If he would have burned uh, coal, thick uh, sulfur coal, and, and send the, um, the uh, what do you call it, pollution over to your house, that's really a trespass, and that would be a violation of property rights. That's uh, an interesting uh, question, by the way. I like a great question, Margie. I, well, well, yeah, it's a very, very good question. Uh, then so what, I don't what, think... What's the libertarian remedy in that kind of situation? Right. Well, I, I was getting to it uh, in my roundabout professorial way. I can never answer a question directly because if I did, they'd kick me out. So I've got to prevaricate. Um, I'm glad you're laughing. I didn't mean that seriously. Um, uh, you don't really own the value of your house. For example, if uh, hippies move in next door and they don't do anything of a pollution type thing, it's just that they, uh, they look hippie-ish and the value of your house declines, well, that libertarians would not count as a, a property rights violation, so it's sort of tough on you. However, there are libertarian remedies, and the remedies are restrictive contracts or condominium contracts. What you do is you, uh, let's say I, I have a five-mile square and I'm going to put in 3,000 houses. And what I do is I don't sell you just the house, but I sell you the house and membership in a condo. So uh, you, you can't get somebody next door who's going to paint his house pink and blue polka dot or, you know, be too hippie-ish or whatever it is that you think will lower your property values. So in economics, this is sometimes called external diseconomies, where somebody moves in next door and see if, it, if it's loud music, that's 
very, very loud music, that's a, a property rights violation like noise pollution. But there are always continuing problems. You know, a guy has a party Saturday night and it's a little loud, and, you know, what about that? Well, that's why you have condominium associations and restrictive covenants to protect yourself against neighbors who can lower your property values, even though you don't own your property values. You only own the uh, physical sanctity of the house, so to speak. So, uh, Dr. Block, would you say it's kind of a buyer beware situation where if you are somebody who privacy is very important, uh, quiet is very important, uh, being able to know what colors your pa- uh, your neighbors can paint their homes is very important to you, then it's uh, it behooves you to do your due diligence and research uh, the areas that you're looking to move to and find something that is uh, is suitable rather than just throwing caution to the wind and you know buying a house in some sort of unre- restricted area, which is, of course, what I like to do, because I like to have the freedom to uh, control my property. Well, I think one of the important things to point out here is that when we're talking about libertarian philosophy, we're talking about living in a society that's completely unlike the one that we live in right now, where there is a really small, limited government. um, And and obviously, since you asked it, this is a real life concern. So there would, in the absence of, of government agencies, like zoning boards and things like that, um, neighborhood organizations where where people would be required to agree to certain terms living in certain neighborhoods would absolutely spring up. Does that make sense? Yeah, I, I, I agree with that. Uh, and I don't really think it's a matter of buyer beware because the, the market helps buyers in all sorts of ways. See, one of the problems that we have now is that we have public roads and streets and highways. And in a purely free society, according to at least my latest book, we would have all of that privatized. And these private road owners would have an incentive to make sure that the value of the property abutting their road is is higher rather than lower, mm. and would naturally act as a uh, uh, benefactor for the for the buyer. It's sort of like uh, in in restaurants. You go into the restaurant, even if we didn't have government certification of food, we would have private ones. Like uh, McDonald's goes around to all their McDonald's places and makes sure that the bathrooms are clean and there are no roaches in the kitchens or whatever. Because if there are, the capital value of McDonald's will plummet, and they've got every incentive to make sure that it's, it's good. Whereas if you have government certification agencies or zoning boards and they make a mistake, well, they're still in business. It's, uh, yes. So we're much better off relying on private alternatives to support consumers or renters or uh, house owners or whoever. Margie, any other thoughts for uh, Dr. Block? Yes. I live in a very large urban historic preservation district, oh, and we we have we have pretty strict rules about uh, uh, well not what color you can paint your house, but you can't you can't put a solarium on the front of your house that juts out forty feet in front, uh, and those historic laws help to keep our values high there and you know what you're getting into when uh, when you buy a house there that this is the way it has to be uh so it's very much like you're saying dr block that that the difference there though and i'll let uh, dr block come in here in a moment i thank you margie for the call is that uh, while you're saying you know what you're getting into it's not always true um and and first of all i'd like to point out that the place i live installed a historic district after I moved in. Now, luckily, I didn't get included, and my property didn't get included in the historic district, but uh, I had no idea that was going to happen, and I don't get the opportunity to say no thanks uh, because it's government. More coming up. Free Talk Live. This is Free Talk Live, your show, Saturday edition. Bring up anything at toll-free number 800-259-9231. That's the SACL CAI toll-free line. It is 1-800-259-9231. Tonight, it's Ian with you. And Julia. Oops. <laughs> you know what? You're on the third mic, and it always and throws me Julia. off. Julia. Julia is with me, graciously sitting in for uh, Mark, who's down in Florida at the moment. 800-259-9231. Right now, if you've got a question for Dr. Walter Block, your calls will be given priority because he is on the line with us uh, calling from Louisiana, where he works at Loyola University. He's a free market economist and anarcho-capitalist. And uh, we're going to get to some more of these calls here. But before we go on, Dr. Block, I'd like to uh, to have you address 
uh, our last caller's point, uh, Margie, who is talking about property rights and uh, in a libertarian kind of world, uh, and she mentioned at the very end of her call the idea of a historic district, saying you know she feels good about the historic district because it protects our values and uh, that, uh, th- th- that she knew what she was getting into. And I-, I just wanted to hear what you would have to say to that. Well, I agreed entirely with your point that a lot of people buy into a house and then it's later... Uh, historically districts eyes over their dead bodies, or I'm not putting it right, but uh, they put in the historic district after they bought it without any buyer leave, so it's it's very different. New Orleans is, uh, in some ways, at least some parts of New Orleans, are really antique houses from two, three hundred years old, mm-hmm. uh, and uh, keeping them the way they are does help uh, tourism, uh, because if, you know, it was just high rises, uh, some of the unique... Uh, uh, attractiveness of New Orleans would be lost. But there's no reason that this couldn't be done on a free enterprise, and as sure. you say, it would be done in a voluntarily, uh, on a voluntary basis on a free enterprise, and it would be done more efficiently under free enterprise. Well, don't you think, <laughs> Dr. Block, that the reason is laziness? I mean, as far as the, the reason why these things are forced down people's throats, uh, for instance, I mean, if they want to f- uh, form a historic district, it takes a lot more effort to go around and make offers to everybody and try to get them to uh, to voluntarily assent to those sorts of rules for their property. And if they don't want to agree, then to buy them out and uh, buy the property yourself and then keep it up as a historic property uh, instead of what they do do, which is just use the the threat of violence from the state and say, all right, now you must obey this you know this set of strictures as far as your property is concerned. Isn't it just pure laziness? Well, I think laziness plays a part in it, uh, and it's a lot easier to win a, uh, a majority vote than a unanimous vote. Mm-hmm. In, in the marketplace, the unanim- unanimity rules. If there's one holdout, then there's nothing you can do about the holdout. Whereas in, in, the, um, in the government, if there's one holdout and 99 people want to make uh, their, their houses into the historical district, they can just force the other guy into doing it, and this isn't right. right. Uh, so okay. libertarians are sticklers for justice and it's not it's tyranny of the majority to force one person when 99 people vote against them to do the will of the 99 yeah and and that's why i didn't have time to call her because we were short on time in that last segment on it but i wanted to call her on uh, her claim that it was protecting our values and i don't know who she's including in our but um i I like the uh, the idea of property being able to progress and move forward into the 21st century and not have to uh to be old and uh and outdated and i know i'm not the only one who feels that way but uh, apparently with a historic district the only people whose values count are those that value old houses did we lose you dr block i think we did lose him uh so i'll tell you what we will uh, do our best to get him back here in moments uh julia your thoughts on any of this any uh, any input um on any of this okay just i figured i'd uh, check with you before we moved on here 800-259-9231 we continue uh we're gonna go to uh i guess ben is in the uk you're on free talk live hello ben ben hello um hi the, you're the on the air I was gonna ask about the whole um defending the undefendable or whatever it was called is you've got some of these issues like the sex issues, say, with younger people or the issues of voluntary cannibalism, which I guess as a libertarian, someone like you, Mark, no, but you, Ian, would say are okay for someone to do. But how do we approach talking about those to other people? Because as Mark liked to point out when he was there, if you just say cannibalism or children and sex in the same sentence, people immediately freak out and think you're a weirdo. Well, I don't know how often it is that uh, cannibalism comes up in conversations about liberty. Uh, Julia, have you ever encountered anyone bringing it up when you've no. talked to them about freedom? Never. Does that happen to you, Ben? People bring up cannibalism? Uh, it, it has come up, but it wasn't discussions about liberty as much, so it's an issue I easily Well, I'll tell you what, uh, he hasn't been in on the conversation here because I was busily trying to uh, dial him up on the line. I think we actually have Dr. Block back with us. Are you there? I am. I'm back now, yes. Okay, welcome back. Uh, the question on the line here uh, from Ben in the UK is, what about cannibalism and child sex? Uh, that's the short version. <laughs> 
Well, uh, let's take cannibalism first. Okay. Uh, if I just go out uh, out of my house and go to the street, and the next passerby I start chomping on him, well, that's a <laughs> violation of rights. So uh, whether I shoot him or kill him or just bite him, biting is uh, an offensive uh, thing, and it would be a rights violation. Now, suppose there are five of us and uh, we're marooned on some desert island and rescue will come in a month and we'll all be dead in a month. Unless we eat one of the five of us and suppose all five agree and say yes, uh, we'll pick, you know, based on dice or short straws or mm -hmm. something like that. And the guy who loses uh, agrees to uh, be eaten by his four buddies well, that would be legitimate. Am I still on the line? You are still here. Ah, good. So voluntary cannibalism, and there are some cases where people get lost here or there. Uh, th that would be legitimate as long as all agreed, and they would each have an incentive to agree, because if they didn't agree, they'd all die. Whereas if they agreed, each would have an 80% chance of life and a 20% chance of being the eaten one. So I think that's okay. Ben, does that answer your uh, question? Yeah, the now, yeah, let's talk about child sex now, or... Okay, let me see. If, uh, ben, did I get your uh, question answered? Uh, the, the other part was, given that that's the libertarian perspective, that you, it can happen on a voluntary level, how do you tell people that without completely freaking them out? Like, voluntary cannibalism is okay, or voluntary child sex could be okay, and people just immediately freak out. How do you recommend stepping around that? Could you hear uh, me? I, I sort of heard it vaguely, and if the I question. hear it correctly, it's uh, this doesn't sound very um, uh, appealing. Uh, we'll turn off the masses. Yes. Well, you know, I'm not really that concerned about turning on the masses. I'm more concerned about the truth. And if the truth hurts and if the masses are such that they'll say, oh, you know, Fooey on libertarianism because we favor cannibalism. Well, you know, uh, what can I say? I, I did say that coercive cannibalism or initiatory cannibalism or cannibalism without permission is a crime. And I, then I said if there are these weird cases where people are marooned, and, and if the average person says, well, I'm rejecting libertarianism because of that, well, what can you that. do? Yeah, they yeah, probably wouldn't do? like a lot of other portions of the philosophy. No doubt about it. They have a problem with something like that. Ben, but thank it you is for life saving, and because if you allow this, then people, everyone has an eighty percent chance of life in the island. And if scenario. you don't allow it, they all die. And you know, the critics have to say, "Well, we're in favor of mass murder." Or I mean, you, I mean, you're bringing the island, island scenario up, but I mean, a real life example was the story in Germany from a few years ago, where and, and Ben, thank you for the call tonight. Uh, the story in Germany where somebody did find a voluntary victim for cannibalism, and they they came to an agreement, and he got eaten, uh, and then later on down the line, the the guy that ate the the other gentleman ended up going to jail for it, and so I don't want to spend money to put somebody in a jail cell that has voluntarily entered into an agreement with somebody else to engage in that behavior. It, it may be despicable behavior. It may be very bizarre, uh, but it's, it's, it shouldn't be illegal. Uh, Dr. Block. I, I think bizarre is a better word than despicable. Because if it's an agreement, who, who are we to say? But it certainly is bizarre. I'll okay, all right. Hang, hang on. We're going to bring you back here. Uh, more with Dr. Block in moments. Uh, your calls as well. Free Talk Live. This is Free Talk Live, the Saturday edition of the program. You can bring up whatever's on your mind. Toll free number 800-259-9231. Uh, again, that is the SACL CAI toll free line, 1-800-259-9231. Tonight, it's Ian joining you. And Julia. And you can join us on our website. If you like the show, you want to help support Free Talk Live, you can do that by becoming a Free Talk Live amplifier for as little as 3 bucks a month. We take that money in, reinvest it into the show, get on more radio stations around the country, bring more Internet listeners on board, expose new people to the ideas of freedom. And some of them can be a little scary. Uh, like, well, <laughs> cannibalism hardly ever comes up, but somebody called in about it tonight, and so we you know, addressed it as, I think, intellectually honestly as possible. And we've got Dr. Walter Block on the line with us here tonight to, uh, to do the heavy lifting. Uh, Dr. Block, welcome back to Free talk live uh, thanks for having me it's interesting I am now writing just uh, today uh, uh, 
a new Defending the Undefendable, tentatively called Defending the Undefendable 2, and you'll never guess which chapter I'm working on right now. Cannibalism. Cannibalism, yeah. How about that? So, so you pointed out that vo- voluntary cannibalism, that's all right, but uh, all the other forms of cannibalism, which involve a victim who has not consented to be a victim, right. then that's clearly out of, uh, out of uh, <laughs> that's not appropriate. That, that is wrong. Right. We can have a campaign poster. Voluntary cannibalism can save lives. <laughs> so uh, let's move on I to mean, let's move on to Ben's other uh, question because we do have another call for you. Yes, uh, uh, but his other question was about child sex. Well, I uh, uh, in in America in our present society, uh, I think that uh, what's it called uh, when you have um, a, an underage girl or an underage boy? Statutory, um, statutory rape. rape. I think statutory rape is reasonable. And with uh, statutory rape laws are reasonable, there's always a continuum problem. You know, where do you set it? I mean, we know that a three-year-old girl can't give consent. So if you uh, sexually involve yourself with a three-year-old girl, you should go to jail or be punished or whatever the punishment is. Whereas if you voluntarily involve yourself with a 23-year-old girl or a woman, that's uh, legitimate because 23 is way over the right age. But what is the right age? Is it 13? 15, no one will ever agree on that. That's one of the biggest right. problems. And in the yeah. meantime, what we have is a an epidemic in this country of 18, 19, 20-year-old guys who are dating 16, 15, and you know, younger girls uh, who in, in many cases are using fraud, engaging in fraud. Uh, a lot of these uh, teenage girls are pretending as though they're older than they actually are in order to do who knows what with these guys. And then they find out down the line that uh, they were misled uh, or even they, even if they didn't know they were misled and they'd still uh, voluntarily consented to sexual activity with these uh, young ladies. And, of course, it does go the other way, but it's mostly guys that are going to jail. Uh, then they end up in a jail cell with a criminal record uh, for doing something that was completely consensual. Of course, around the country, ages of consent range from as low as 16 up to 18. It used to be 14 in Hawaii. Canada used to have it as uh, as 14 for the longest time, and they didn't have a problem with teenage pregnancies like uh, the United States uh, has has and does. So it's just an absolute mess, and when you talk to people about it, they'll all have different ideas to what the right age should be. Perhaps, uh, Dr. Block, should it be something that's decided uh, by an arbitrator who can actually, instead of just judging uh, you know, judging by the law on the books, can actually look at the specifics of the case, talk to the people uh, involved, and you know, the arbitrator make the decision as to whether or not this person was taken advantage of? What, one well, thing that I... I'm sorry. Ahead, One no, thing that ahead. I would suggest would be, I mean, if you're to live in this society like we currently have where there are laws of, of the, or not not laws, but, but court systems sort of as we have it, um, I, I would imagine the way I think that it should run at least would be that where what we currently have, the, the state goes after people. You know what I mean? Like if a, if a 13-year-old and a 12-year-old have sex with each other and one of them happens to get pregnant, then not only do they have to deal with that pregnancy, but if it's one of the states where that's against the law, the state can choose to go after a person like that, and then they're sex offenders for life. Without having someone press charges, you mean? Right, that's what I'm saying, is is if we had a, if we were to have some sort of a system, if we had a system where... The only charges, the only way that could be done is if somebody actually pressed charges against somebody. So, like, I'm 14, I had sex with my 16 year old boyfriend, I felt violated. I feel like that they're really the only person that can make that claim, and that some arbitrary group like government sitting around in a room saying, okay, once you're 14 years old, you are okay to make those sorts of decisions by yourself. Like that doesn't really jive with me because I consider myself to be a much more mature 14 year old than other 14 year olds that I knew. And I was a much more mature 17 year old than other 17 year olds I knew. And if we're making decisions based on, you know, the average person, well, then I kind of get screwed in that situation. See, the problem is if you set it in at any age, let's say 16, which is not an unreasonable age, there are some people younger than 16 who are more mature uh, than, than other people who are older than 16 or less mature. Uh, one possibility is to have free enterprise courts, and uh, we know that competition brings about a better product. We libertarians don't have to solve every issue. Uh, we have to favor, I think, private courts, which would do a much better job. Right. One of the uh, points I think you're making is, suppose it's 16, and now you have a a boy who's 16 and one month and a girl who's 15 and 11 months. They're mm-hmm. just two months apart. 
and now the, uh, you know he can be accused of statutory rape. I think that we ought to also maybe I'm speculating the law, the free enterprise law, also ought to take into account not just the the 16 cutoff, but how old the guy is. Like this seems to me to be a difference between a a boy who's 16 years and one month and a girl who's 15 years and 11 months on the one hand, and a 15-year-old girl, a 15- and 11-month-old girl, and a 50-year-old man, it seems uh, that uh, the latter would be taking more advantage of her than the former. But uh, this is sort of But it all depends, though, doesn't it depend on oh, the, yes, on the yes, circumstances? Yes. Uh, I mean, this is one of the reasons why... We can have a situation where the 50-year-old man is innocent, but these are very uh, big complications, and I think one mistake is sometimes made to think that libertarians have to answer all questions better than anyone else, these are very difficult questions. Uh, there are continuum problems. But let me mention something that is very radical libertarian. Uh, if I had a three-year-old daughter and I was in a, a starving situation where we were going to starve and there was this pedophile who wanted to take advantage of her, I would rather uh, that she engaged in sex with this rich guy than died. So That's, we could even have an exception talk there. About a, a talk about a what-if scenario that uh, is a pretty pretty unlikely, although I, I see where you're coming from on that. Uh, let's go quickly here to Steve in Pennsylvania. You're on with Dr. Walter Block. Hello, Ian. Hello, Dr. Block. How are you doing? Julia is here, too. Go ahead, Steve. Julia. Hi, Julia. Hello. Um, Dr. Block. Hi there. Dr. Block, I understand that you actually came to Libertarian um, while you were in college, but I also understood that you were partially, possibly even uh, leaning towards a communist at that time. And uh, I think it would be helpful for all of those who are trying to spread the, the, uh, the ideals of liberty on how you came to libertarianism from your extreme left-wing um, uh, uh, star. Good question, well, Steve. I, Thank I'm, you. I'm, I'm Jewish, and I was from New York City. And to say a, a New York City Jew leftist is almost a redundancy. All of us were that <laughs> way, and I just guess I fell into that uh, sort of thinking. <clears throat> I was a student at Brooklyn College. I was a senior in college, about 21 years old, and Ayn Rand came to lecture, and I came to boo and hiss her because she favored free enterprise, and as we all knew, we socialists, you know, free enterprise is evil. And uh, after the uh, lecture, there was an announcement that the Ayn Rand Study Club that had invited her to speak was having a luncheon in her honor, and everyone was invited, whether you agreed or not. And I didn't have enough booing and hissing at her, so I came to the thing. And there was this long table of about 50 people, 25 on a side, and I was relegated to the foot of the table. I turned to my neighbor and I said, hey, this capitalism is no good, uh, socialism is better, what do you say? And he said, well, I don't really know, but the people who do are at the other end of the table. So I went at the other end of the table and I stuck my head in between Ayn Rand's and Nathaniel Brandon's and I said, there's a socialist who wants to debate people on this. And I said, oh yeah, who's that? And I said, it's me. And Brandon was very gracious. He agreed to come to the other end of the table where there was a seat for him, my end of the table. Walter, I have to tell you, you've got to fast forward the story to like less than 30 seconds. And he uh, said that he would do this under two conditions. One, that I read two books, Atlas Shrugged and Economics in One Lesson and the other that we continue this conversation until we finish it, and I did. I met him four or five times with Ayn Rand, and I read the two books, and that's how I got converted. That's, a, that's an amazing story, and uh, I thank you for, for taking the time to sit in with us here tonight on Free Talk Live, answer some what I think were some very good questions uh, this evening, and we're going to go on to discuss uh, teenage prostitution here in moments. I'm sure that uh, you would find that to be something you could defend uh, as well, but unfortunately we're out of time for this hour. So, Dr. Walter Block, uh, people can get in touch with you one more time, your website, if you don't mind. WalterBlock.com or Mises.com, M-I-S-E-S.com. Thanks for having me. Hey, no problem. WalterBlock.com. And as you said, you're working on a brand new book, uh, a sequel, if you will, to Defending the Undefendable. So looking forward to talking about that when it comes out. And uh, have a great night. Enjoy your weekend. More Free Talk Thanks. Live is on Thanks the again. way. Yes, sir. 800-259-9231. That's the SACL CAI toll free line. Hour 2 coming up. You bring up anything. 
DVD, books, music, instruments, periodicals, computers, software, electronics, photo, cell phone, office products, home and garden, bed and bath, furniture, kitchen, pet supply, automotive, hardware, apparel, shoes, jewelry, grocery, healthcare, sports and outdoors, toys, games, used and more. It's a department store at your fingertips. Amazon.freetalklive.com. Get all your shopping done, a great deal, delivery to your door, and a percentage of your purchase will go to Free Talk Live when you enter Amazon through Amazon.freetalklive.com. 